All right, now in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, great chapter, we're going to be focusing on the verses there right, near, right at the very end of the chapter from verse 24 through the end of the chapter. The Bible reads, I'll read it, we'll read it again real quick one more time. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain, and every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a, cor a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. And what we're preaching this morning is on the subject of temperance. And that in verse 25 there it says, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now, while we're in this, as long as we're in this, this section, you know, I kind of want to bring this up. This is not what the sermon's about. It's, about. it's about temperance. But this blew me away the first time I heard it. I couldn't believe it was actually in, um, in a Bible version. In the, the NIV for this chapter, we'll read verses 26 and 27. It says, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. Now that's pretty easy to understand what that verse is saying there, right? I keep under my body, I bring it into subjection, meaning I have control over my body. I'm bringing my body under, my, under subjection. My body isn't dictating everything that I go about and do. And this has everything to do with temperance as we're preaching on this morning. But in the NIV, the, Bible, the, the NIV reads in this section, it says, Therefore I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. That is not saying the same thing. Striking a blow to my body is not the same as keeping your body under subjection. Two different things. And, and when I heard that, I just it, it sounds so ridiculous. Like, how could anyone even say that this is the word of God saying, no, I strike a blow to my body? And one of the reasons why this is so important is because, you know, there are people out in the world today that think that when they strike blows to their own body, there are people that whip themselves and make themselves go through some, it's, it's really like a mutilation of their own body. They think that they're serving God. They think that they're serving Christ when they do these things. And when you're reading a false version of the Bible, when you're reading something that's not coming from God, you're going to have verses like this in there that says, no, I strike a blow to my body. You're going to think, hey, that's what I should be doing. But I, I mean, there's, there's no reason to change any of this that completely changed the meaning of the verse. It skews it, it perverts it. But what the Bible is saying here, it's, it's very simple to understand. I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. And I just, I just wanted to throw that out there in case you haven't heard that reference before, or if you haven't seen that. Um, it's something that's kind of far out there, and it just makes NIV look ridiculous that, that they even have that verbiage in there, which, which is not a proper translation whatsoever. But back to temperance, because this is, this is what, the, what I want to focus on this morning, is, is keeping your body into subjection. Keeping, keeping yourself, you know, dictating what your body is going to do. Dictating yourself, you know, that you're not going to allow your body to pull you into sin. And we see here um, a reference that we all run in a race. You know, in this, li this lifetime that we have before us is being likened unto running a race. And he uses this analogy and he says that, um, that, you know, all which run in a race, but only one person receives the prize. So he's telling us, you know, you need to run so that you could obtain the prize. He says, every man that striveth for the mastery, mastery being, you know, being an expert, being, being the one that's going to win that race, is temperate in all things. If you want to win that race, he says, you need to be temperate in all things. He says, now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. So the people who run the races, you know, running a marathon or going to the Olympics and they run this race, they win a crown, right? I mean, they win a medal or, or you know, some kind of reward. But that's a corruptible reward. That's just, that's just something that's in this world. It's all going to be burned up and pass away. Mm -hmm. But the race that we're running is the one that run, where we earn an incorruptible crown. We're, we're running a race where we could earn treasures for ourselves in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and thieves do not break forth nor steal. We're not going to lose that reward. You cannot lose the rewards that we earn for ourselves in heaven. And he likens that to a race. We're running a race. Look at Philippians 3. Did you, did you put a finger in there? Philippians chapter 3, we're going to see here also a similar 
um, analogy about about you know striving to to press toward the mark for the prize. In Philippians chapter 3, look at verse number 10. And keep your fingers still in 1 Corinthians 9, if I forgot to tell you that already, because I've got to flip right back real quick. To uh, if, um, if you've already gone past it, it's fine. But um, Philippians chapter 3, look at verse number 10. It says that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I had already attained, Either we're already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now I want to stop here real quick and point out it's, it's kind of a, a funny the way, the way it's written there. You know, it may not be easy to get right away. And I've actually had people come to me and say, you know, I, I've had discussions where they would say that um, see, you know, you have to do good works in order, in order to, to be at the resurrection of the dead. And they'll point to this verse and say that. And, and that is simply not true. And it's just a misunderstanding of what this is saying and what, what the point he's trying to make here. Now, every saved person, you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works as any man should boast. Hey, no amount of works that you do, no matter how good you are, is going to get you that reward of, of just being saved to be at that resurrection from the dead. Now, we are going to have that resurrection if you're saved. But look at what he's saying here. He says, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. He's, he's using this illustration of his good works to like as if he could attain unto it. And it says, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect. So he didn't, he's like, I haven't attained it through his perfection, through, through my own good works and everything else. He says, but I follow after if that I may apprehend, which is to get that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. He's making it clear, look, I am apprehended. I have already received this through Christ Jesus. But he's looking at it in a sense that, look, I want to run and I want to work towards this as if I didn't receive it as a free gift and I'm going to try my hardest and do the best works and do everything I can to try to like attain unto that. He's already acknowledging, I've already been apprehended of this. I am going to be in the resurrection through Christ Jesus because I received it as a free gift, but I want to live my life in a way where I'm doing as much good work as possible as if I were trying to meet the requirements of that perfect life that, you know, because there's two ways of heaven, right? One is if you're perfect and you never sin and you do everything right. The other way is to receive it as a free gift. And we've all fallen short of, of the other way. <laughs> none of us is perfect. There is none righteous. No, not one. But that doesn't mean that we just give up and throw in the towel and not just and not continue to try to live that righteous life and try to live as perfect as we can and not try to run the race as if we could, you know, try to attain it ourselves. Look, we acknowledge and we know for a fact that we're saved by grace, but the way that we live our lives needs to be one. And that's why he says here in verse 3, it needs to be one where we're going to strive for that. We're going to try to achieve perfection. We, we may never reach that. We won't ever reach that. We're going to have sin in our life. But that's the goal. That's the high mark. That's what we're shooting for as we live our lives. And he says in verse 13, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. And that's what he's saying. Look, I don't, I don't in myself, I don't count myself as of apprehending that because I'm still striving and pushing forward. He says, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. We'll keep reading here. Verse 15 says, let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained and again, he makes mention to, we have already attained this. Let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an ensample. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ 
whose end is destruction, whose God is in their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Now, this ties in perfect with, with the analogy of running a race that we saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And it says, every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. You have your body under control and subjection. And when he refers to the enemies here in Philippians chapter 3, the enemies of the cross of Christ are those, it says, whose God is their belly. People who, are, who live their lives as one, it's a philosophy of, well, if it feels good, do it, right? You think about your belly, and your belly is a place where, obviously, you, the first thing I think of is like food. We, when you experience hunger, then you need to eat some food, and you're going to satisfy that craving. But when the Bible talks about the belly, it's not just like referring to food. It's any type of lust, any type of, of desire of your flesh is often referred to as your belly, which says your God is your belly. So basically people who, you know, anything that's going to feel good, that's what they're going to do. And that's what they live for. And, and, and that becomes their God. He says they're the enemies of the cross of Christ. We need to be different from that. We need to be different from these. We need to run the race to where... You know, just because we might have this fleshly appetite or this, this physical desire to want to do something, I'll tell you what, that's how sin deceives you in the first place. Mm -hmm. It makes you think that this is something good. You know, Satan will deceive you and make you think, hey, this is something I want to go do. You know, it makes alcohol look so much fun. He makes, you know, all these other fornication, adultery makes it look so much fun. And, and the ends thereof are death. And now if you just had this desire, just, just I'm going to obey my belly. I'm just going to obey all the lusts of my flesh. And you have no restraint. Then you're just going to go out and live in filth and live in wickedness. And all these dis deceits that are out there are going are to appeal to your appetite and appeal to your flesh. And you'll just get caught up in that. But we need to make sure that we are temperate, that we have control of ourselves. We don't want to be, because you know what, people who don't have control over their bodies, what do they become like? They become like an animal. Animals have their instincts and they do what they do under the instinct. They don't have the same self-control that people do, that human beings do. God has given us a conscience. God has given us a mind and a soul and a spirit. And he's given us this ability to understand right from wrong, to know good and evil. And he's given us the free will to choose what we're going to do with our life. We need to be able to make that choice to be temperate in our life, that we don't get too caught up in any one thing. And this doesn't just have to be things that are sinful. We're going to get into that in a minute. We need to learn to keep our body under subjection in all things. And having temperance is all about being able to control yourself. And it applies to many areas, being temperate in all things, as, as the Bible said in, in our opening chapter. Now, a common problem that people might have controlling, when you think of temper and temperance, is controlling their temper. It's controlling their emotions, right? That's the first thing that came to my mind. And it, just the word temperance itself is related to people losing their temper, right? That's what happens when someone gets angry and then maybe they start acting out and getting violent because they lose their temper. They lose their control. Something happens that angers them. And instead of staying in control of their body, now they just act out and they you know, punch someone in the face or they just start acting out in anger because they've lost their temper. And the Bible teaches us that we ought never to lose that temperament. And um, the Bible says that's why one of the, one of the requirements for a pastor in, in Titus chapter 1, verse 7, you have to turn to the Bible reads, For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre. See, the pastor's not someone who's supposed to just be flying off the handle every two minutes, right? You're not soon angry. You know, you're gonna, as a pastor, you're going to receive a lot of provocation. Satan's going to come and attack you. And, and as a, every Christian will too, it's not just for the pastor, but for the pastor in this role, if you're going to have somebody leading the church, if you're going to be someone in charge, they better not be someone that's just going to be flying off the handle and not able to control their temper because there are going to be a lot of attacks. There's going to be a lot of things coming your way, but not just for the pastor. You need to, you know, again, everything that's all the requirements for a pastor also applies to every single individual Christian. These are things that, that God has a standard for for everybody. This is the way we all ought to be living our life and, and applying these to ourselves. But he's basically just saying that you cannot be the pastor if you don't meet these requirements. But these are all requirements that, that should be kept by all of us, um, especially when we talk about you know, not giving to wine, no striker, so someone who just goes and gets into fights, not greedy of filthy lucre. 
but not soon angry. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 7 verse 8, it says, Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof, and the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. So again, we get more wisdom from Ecclesiastes telling us not to be hasty in our spirit just to get angry. And the way we're going to do that is with temperance, being able to control your body, control your emotions, control these things that come up. And I'll tell you what, people end up making a lot of really poor decisions when you end up making emotional decisions. So we need to have the temperance to, to take a step back, to have that control and not just be super impulsive. Something comes up in our life and you just feel like you have to react right away without ever thinking about it first. When you make that just initial reaction, you know, whatever it is, just make a decision based on emotion. Maybe someone, someone does you wrong and you're like, well, you know what? I'm going to go back and get them or I'm, you know, I'm going to cut them off. And you just make these snap, snap decisions. They tend to not be very, very wise decisions. We need to have the, the, the temperance, the control over our emotions to be able to control that, not to be hasty in spirit, not to be hasty to get angry. Um, Proverbs 16, verse 32 says, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. He's saying it's a lot better. You know, there's these, there's these mighty men of war we read about in the Bible, mighty men that are able to go out and attack and conquer cities and take over and they could become the king or whatever. And he says, you're way better than that person. It's a lot better to be slow to anger and to rule your own spirit than it is just to, to be able to conquer someone and take over a city. It's better for you to be able to have that control. Now, there are many things that by themselves are not sinful, just in and of itself. Even, believe it or not, even anger. Anger is not always a sin. The Bible teaches that not to be angry with your brother without a cause. So you shouldn't just be angry at people for no reason, without, without a valid cause. But... You know, the Bible talks about God getting angry. God is angry with the wicked every day, the Bible says. The Bible even talks about Jesus being angry. Jesus got angry when the money changers were in the temple and he saw people buying and selling in God's house and he, you know, and he got really upset. He got angry, but he didn't sin because it was a righteous anger. And the Bible says, um, you know, be ye angry and sin not. It's possible to have anger, to be angry about something and still not sin. Um, now, it's not, I don't think it's very often when being angry is not a sin. I mean, there, there's definitely situations where it's okay to, be, to have righteous anger. But you ought not to be an angry person in general and just let all the little things just get you angry. You know, that, that I believe would be a sin. You're just getting soon angry. But what Jesus even shows, and I'm, I'm not going to turn to the passage, but he flipped over the money changers' tables and he drove them out with a whip. But you can see the temperance that Jesus Christ had because when he saw that, it wasn't just an instant reaction to go and just start throwing over tables like he lost control, like he lost his temper. The Bible is very clear to say that he made a scourge of cords. Now, he had to sit down and actually make the whip that he used to, to whip every, to, to drive out the people out of the temple which means there was some time that passed. It's not like he just blew up when he saw this and just lost control. He had already decided in his head how he was going to deal with this situation. He saw the situation, he analyzed it, it made him angry, and he decided that he was going to drive him out. So he sat down, he, he made the whip, and then he flipped over the tables, and then he drove them out. He was in control, but that was an action that he had decided to do in his mind, that this is how he was going to deal with that problem. And um, that was not a sin. We know Jesus Christ is not a sinner. So in everything that he did, that was not sinful whatsoever. But there's a lot of other things, right, um, that, that aren't sins, but we have to be careful that we're temperate with them, that, that we're in control. Um, and one of the things, though, while we're talking about this, one of the things that's, that's not like that is drinking alcohol, okay? A lot of people will try to tell you, well, drinking alcohol is okay as long as you do it in moderation. No, the Bible says to be sober. That's right. You take that first sip of booze and you're not sober. You may think you are. You might not be drunk. You might not be falling on your face. But you are not sober. You are not completely sober. You need, you, God wants you to have a clear mind and a sober mind. 
um, to live your life and not to introduce spirits into your body. Yes, that's what they're called. You see at the liquor store, wine and spirits. Yeah, you don't want to go get those spirits. That is not something that you want to introduce and bring inside your own body. So I reject this, this nonsense of, of alcohol is fine, drinking alcohol is fine in moderation. No, it's not. The Bible talks about drunkenness yet, but it also talks about being sober. And that applies to drugs, to everything. We need to be sober. But let's, let's go on. Let's move about, think about some other things that, you know, they're not a sin in and of themselves, like eating food. It's not a sin to eat food. Obviously, our bodies, need, we need to survive. We need to keep going. There's nothing wrong with eating food. But what about if that turns into gluttony? Now, that's a sin. If we don't have the proper control to control our appetite and to control our actions with food, it's very easy. You could get, you get caught up into this, this love of food where you just start eating and eating and eating and eating and eating. Now, all of a sudden, that's turning into a sin. See, food by itself and eating by itself is fine. But when you become intemperate and you lose this control and you're not able to control what you're doing with your body and what you're putting into yourself, that's when it becomes a sin. The Bible says um, in Proverbs 23, verse 20, it says, Be not among wine-bibbers, among riotous eaters of flesh, for the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. Now, ultimately, what we're trying to control with being temperate is our flesh. We're trying to keep our bodies in subjection. We have fleshly desires. You know, with eating is a fleshly desire. It's something our body needs. There's nothing wrong with that, but we, again, we need to keep that temperate. Now, another, th another example would be, you know, having an intimate relationship with someone of the opposite gender. There's nothing wrong with that in and of itself, right? It's, it's, it's completely normal, natural, but it has to be done under God's constraints. God has ordained marriage where that, that act, that relationship is the only acceptable way that, that, is, that, that you can have that type of a relationship. Now you may have, you do, I mean men especially, but men and women both have physical needs, physical desires that you, that you want to maybe engage in these acts, but we need to make sure that we're temperate, we're able to control our bodies, control those desires, control that, that appetite, and do it the right way. Do it in God's way. Do it, you know, if you, if you want to do that, the Bible even says, you know, hey, get married. That you don't sin. But it's never okay to commit fornication or to go out and commit adultery. It's a constant struggle that we have between the flesh and the spirit. Temperance is, is being able to keep that flesh subdued so that we can walk in the spirit. Turn, if you would, to uh, Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Now I'll read from you from Matthew 26, verse 41. Matthew 26, 41 says, this was Jesus Christ speaking to his apostles in the Garden of Gethsemane. If you remember, you know, um, right before Jesus would be crucified, he went into the garden to pray, and he was real heavy, and his you know, the, the disciples were with him, and he said, Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And see, he was asking them to stay awake. He was asking them to just to be there for him and to pray, but they kept falling asleep. Right? They kept falling asleep because their, their bodies were tired. Their body had this physical desire to just want to just shut down, close your eyes, and get some rest. And again, there's nothing wrong with sleep. Right? We all need it, just like eating food. But you don't want to let that take over your life either where you just become a, you know, a sluggard. You're not, you're not doing any work because you're sleeping all day. You're sleeping all night. You're taking naps and just, and just letting that become intemperate in your life. He's the, Jesus said that your spirit is willing. You want to do what's right, but your flesh is weak. And the flesh is what we need to control. Um, Romans 6, look at verse 16. The Bible says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart 
that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members' servants to righteousness unto holiness. And we see those words there in verse 19, the infirmity of your flesh, right? The weakness of your flesh. Your flesh is weak and your, and your flesh is going to try to drag you down with its fleshly desires. And he says, as you have in the past, you yielded your members. Yield means you allowed. Right? You're, you're allowing that to happen. You see the yield signs sometimes have a stop sign. And what does a yield sign mean? It means you're supposed, if someone else is coming, you're supposed to, you stop and let them go first. You're yielding to them. You're allowing them to go. He says here, you have yielded your members, talking about your body, servants to uncleanness. He says you've allowed your body to become subject unto sin and, and to the desires of your flesh. And he's telling you, but even so now, Allow your members, yield your members, servants to righteousness unto holiness. So instead, of, instead of allowing your body to just be overcome and overtaken with sin and fleshly desires, he says you need to allow your body to, to have unto righteousness and unto holiness, to living righteously, to living right. Um, and that tells me if he's saying that you've yielded your, your members to, to servants to uncleanness, but now telling you to yield your members to servants to righteousness, that tells me you have control over that. You can't just say, oh, well, you know, my fleshly desire just caused me to do this. You have control over that. You can choose which way you're going to go. You can choose how you're going to control your body. Now, you're going to have to strengthen your body because your flesh is weak. Hey, if you're not living right, if you're not reading the Bible, if you're not praying, if you're not talking with God, if you're not going to church, you know what's going to be weak is your spirit. And see, there's this dichotomy that we have. When you're saved, you have a new creature that's born inside of you. You have a new spirit. And that spirit wants to do what's right. That spirit wants to live for God. That spirit wants to go to church. That spirit wants to see people get saved. But you still have this old flesh. You still have this sinful nature. We still have this sinful flesh. So we have this war, this battle that's going on in our flesh Turn, if you would, to Galatians chapter 5. And we need to make sure that we're continuing to strengthen our spirit. We want our spirit to be stronger than our flesh. See, if you just keep on feeding the flesh and giving in to your flesh and just living in sin and doing all these things that you want to do, your flesh is going to get stronger and stronger. Your spirit's going to get weaker. If you're living in the flesh, you are not walking in the spirit. And, and on the flip side, if you're walking in the spirit, you're not walking in the flesh. They're completely opposite things. You're either walking in one or the other. And we're going to see that in Galatians chapter 5. Look at verse number 16 of Galatians chapter 5. He says, This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So he's saying, look, if you're walking in the spirit, if you're doing what's right by God, you're praying, you're reading about it, and you're walking in that spirit, you are not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. Because you are walking in that new man. You are walking in that spirit. We need to make sure that we're not feeding that flesh. We're not allowing that flesh to become stronger. That we don't fulfill the lusts of the flesh by keeping in the spirit. Look at verse 17. The Bible says, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. And that word would there just means like what you will or what you want. What you want to do, what your spirit wants to do, he's saying you can't do those things because your flesh is battling your spirit and, and trying to drag you into doing things that are wrong. And they're contrary. They're completely contradictory to each other. Your spirit versus your flesh. One is trying to get you to do good. The other one's trying to get you to do evil. Look at verse 18. It says, But... If you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, excuse me, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. 
Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Now we see here that um, there's all these sins listed off. Th those are the works of the flesh. If you're walking in the flesh, these are some of the things that you're going to be prone to being into and, and you're, going to, you're going to fall into. This is the type of sins you're going to be committing. And he says, and such, like it's not just these specific things, but all kinds of sin. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit, when you're walking in the Spirit, this is the fruit of that. When you're walking in the Spirit, you'll have the love, the joy, the peace, the long-suffering. And you notice there, the last thing in verse 23 is temperance. Walking in that Spirit Will, not fulfill, will make sure that you're not fulfilling the lusts of the flesh and you have that control, you have that temperance. Temperance is a fruit of the Spirit. We can have temperance, we can have that control, especially if you're saved, you have the Spirit inside of you. You need to walk in that Spirit to gain that temperance. Now, turn if you would, this is the last place we're going to turn, is 2 Peter chapter number 1. This is the last place, 2 Peter chapter number 1. We see in 2 Peter chapter 1, there's a checklist, basically, of a lot of attributes that every Christian ought to have, or at least strive to have in their lives. 2 Peter chapter 1, look at verse number 5 of 2 Peter chapter 1, right near the end of the Bible, 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter number 1, verse number 5, the Bible reads, And beside this, giving all diligence. Diligence is, I mean, you are really paying a lot of attention to that. You are being diligent about it. You're, you're really focused on it. This is something we need to take heed to and make sure that we're really focused on. We don't just, just treat it as, as you know, something that's not very important. We need to give all diligence, he says, add to your faith virtue. So first thing you need to do, you get saved, you have faith. Right? You put your faith in Christ. So add to that virtue. Virtue is doing good. Doing good works, right? And then add to virtue, knowledge. So right away you should start doing good, but then add to that good, the, the good deeds, knowledge. Start learning more. You need to continue learning about the Bible. And then he says, and to knowledge, temperance. So as you start, you know, doing good things, you know, walking in the Spirit, gaining this knowledge, now you're going to start adding control to that. And, and as you learn more, you're going to understand more about sin. What is a sin? What's not a sin? Now you need to start adding that temperance and that control of your body. And he says, into temperance, patience. In order to maintain control of your body, you're going to need to be patient. Sometimes you're going to need to suffer to maintain that control and that temperance because your flesh is going to be making you really want to be pulling you in this direction towards sin. But you need to have the patience to maintain your temperance, your control of your body. And he says, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. So the end of all of this is charity where you're, you're basically bringing every, you know, all this goodness then upon other people. And, and bestowing that type of a love where you're helping other people out and lifting other people up. You're, you're, you're getting yourself right through all these actions of adding virtue and knowledge and temperance and patience and godliness. And then you add the brotherly kindness and then finally charity to where you know, you're getting yourself and your own life in order first before you could start helping others. And then you start helping other people out and, and repeat the cycle. Now look, maybe some of you have all this in your life, maybe you don't, but this is something that we need to be diligent about in making sure that all of these things in First Peter chapter 1 are part of your life. That you're not lacking in any one of these areas, whether it be the virtue or whether it be the knowledge, whether it be the temperance or the godliness or the brotherly kindness or the charity. All of these things need to be abounding in our lives. It says, look at verse number eight, it says, for if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you have all these things, if, if these things are in you and they abound and, and you, know, you have a surplus of this, he says that will make you not to be barren or unfruitful. You will be reproducing in the fact that you will be leading other people to Christ. You will be bringing forth fruit unto Christ. And um, you know, so basically, what am I trying to The main point I'm trying to get across this morning is temperance. Temperance is controlling your body, controlling that flesh. That we all have that, that. We all live in the flesh. We have it here. 
But we need to be walking in the Spirit as much as is humanly possible. Keep that in your mind. You know, don't allow this, this body to pull you into sin. You're going to need to learn how to deny yourself. And I'll bring up this point real quick. I know I still have to do a sermon on fasting. But fasting is a great way to train yourself to be able to, to have that type of temperance. If you can do a fast for a day, what that, that there's so many benefits to fasting. You're teaching and training yourself to say, oh, you know what, I'm hungry. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to choose not to fulfill that desire. And anyone who's fasted for any period of time will know this is true. You know, you start fasting. It's okay in the morning you wake up. You know, you, don't, you may not be that hungry. And then the day starts going by. You start feeling, oh, I'm kind of hungry. I could eat so much. Oh, no, no, I'm fasting. I'm not going to do that. And then, like, by the time dinner time rolls around, I remember if I would be fasting at work and I'd be driving home on my motorcycle, people would be, like, cooking on their barbecues or something, and you smell that food, and, man, does that smell appetizing. When you haven't eaten all day and you smell that food and you have that urge, and, and, it's, it, and the urge gets stronger and stronger. I mean, that desire to eat just, just really builds up in you. But I'll tell you what, if you can do that type of a fast, it's going to build your character. You're going to start to understand that you have this control. You don't just have to, to give into it. And it'll strengthen you and empower you to not just control. I mean, the, controlling the food is just one small thing. And that's not even the most important thing. But what you're doing is you're training yourself to say, oh, okay, now as I was able to withhold food for myself, I need to also be able to withhold any other aspect of my life where I'm struggling or where I'm allowing myself to get too caught up into something or get addicted in, into one area. And it could be anything. I mean, I listed off a few very common things, but anything that's just consuming your life and taking over where you're just completely unbalanced and maybe it's drawing you away from serving God. Hey, we need to be temperate and learn to, to get ourselves back in check and to take control and say, no, you know what? I'm not going to do that. Whether it be a hobby, whether it be work, wh whatever it is, whatever it is that's consuming you. That, that you're f fulfilling a desire. Hey, we need to control ourselves, control our spirit, and exert that temperance. And this is a daily battle. This is something that we have to deal with every single day of our life. But we need to be diligent about it. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for this opportunity to preach to you. Lord, help us all to be temperate. Lord, help us learn how to, how to control our, our fleshly desires, our appetites, dear Lord to be able to just be subject unto you and to your ordinances. Lord, I pray that you would please help us to, to run the race in, in a way that, that we're striving for the mastery, dear Lord, and that we could keep our body under subjection and that we would be in control and that we could make the proper decisions, dear Lord, that we're not just under bondage to this sin, but that we have the victory over it. We know we have the victory through Jesus Christ, dear Lord, but help us to have that victory daily in our lives over the sin that's trying to bring us back into bondage, dear Lord. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.